Okay, let's get started. Good evening. Welcome. I'm Dan Southern, and thank you so much for coming out tonight and uh, uh, listening to the uh, webinar. Um, we're going to talk about um, a new field of medicine that can help you avoid uh, surgery on your joint or for any orthopedic condition you might have. I'd like to talk about how that uh, new field works, uh, some examples of it, compare it to traditional uh, orthopedics, uh, and then discuss who's a good candidate for this type of work, um, review some of the uh, data that we keep on these uh, procedures that we do, and uh, then end with uh, uh, just a final word of caution. Uh, I have a lot of slides, so I apologize in advance. Um, so let's get started. Uh, does your joint pain really need surgery? Well, we're going to talk about a new field of medicine that may make it so that you don't need surgery. So let's jump right in. In 2005, Regenex physicians were the first doctors on earth to begin treating orthopedic conditions using precise stem cell injections. This is the case report of the uh, first injection. It was published in 2006. This was a 64-year-old male with a 20-year history of knee uh, of hip pain. Rather, uh, it was very uh, bad uh, hip arthritis. Uh, he was a candidate for total joint replacement. Regenex physicians injected him twice with his bone marrow, the first time with 100,000 nucleated cells and the second time with 300,000. Uh, two months after the first injection, they got an MRI. And this is the MRI before they did the injection. You see there's no joint space between the ball joint of the hip and the cup of the hip, and it looks pretty destroyed. Uh, two months after the procedure, lo and behold, you can see a joint space and you can see a black line of neocortical formation. This was fairly dramatic uh, proof of concept that stem cells could alter the course of arthritis in the human body. All of this represents a new medical specialty. It's known as interventional orthopedics. So what is interventional orthopedics? Well, the best way to explain that is to compare it to traditional orthopedics. Traditional orthopedics uses a lot of tools, uh, scalpels, drills, saws, they're incising, cutting, grinding, amputating, they're placing screws, plates, rods, nails, a lot of hardware. The metaphor here is one of carpentry. Compare that to interventional orthopedics. In interventional orthopedics, all we use is a needle and very advanced imaging to elegantly place this needle through the skin into target tissues and to inject our patient's own blood and or cells. And what we're doing is delivering growth factors to damaged tissues. The metaphor here is one of gardening. In traditional orthopedics, you remove, you rearrange, you deconstruct, reconstruct, you replace native structures. In interventional orthopedics, the difference is that we are attempting to repair and regrow tissue. We are attempting to preserve native structures and that is the bedrock of this field. It's very, very uh, uh, fundamental to the concept of interventional orthopedics. Why? because the design of the human body has been refined for millennium and it's quite a sublime design. And when you operate, whatever your goal is in that operation, it's going to come at a cost because you are going to change the design of the human body. I'd like to talk now about the traditional algorithm of treatment in any orthopedic office in the country for a joint injury or any other musculoskeletal injury. Starts with the injury. Um, if you know enough, you wrap it up, you put some ice on it, you take some ibuprofen, you elevate it, you rest it, and baby it for a day or two, and that usually solves it. But when it doesn't, you call up your internal medicine doc and he says, well, you, you go see the physical therapist. So you go work with a professional for four weeks and generally that'll do the trick. But if it doesn't and you go back to the internal medicine doc, he says, well, go see my friend, the orthopedic. The orthopedic says, oh, you didn't respond to physical therapy. Let's do a steroid injection. So he does a steroid injection in office. And again, that can solve it at least for a time. But assuming it comes right back, you go back to the orthopedist and the orthopedist orders an MRI. Well, if you're standing in an orthopedics office and you're looking at an MRI, your chances for surgery go up 90%. The dirty secret of surgery is that it quite often leads to more surgery. Time goes by, you have a couple more injuries to the joint, you get a few more steroid injections, and before you know it, 
you're a candidate for a total joint replacement. This, in essence, is the algorithm for any joint pain in any orthopedics office in the country today. So what's wrong with this algorithm? Well, <clears throat> number one, steroid injections. Steroids are toxic to tissues. There is a study that was quite eye-opening uh, in the Journal of American Medical Association in 2017. They injected 140 knees. 70 knees got steroid injections every three months for two years, a total of eight injections. The other 70 knees got injections of normal saline. At the end of two years, they took MRIs of all the knees that were injected, and what did they show? They showed 50% cartilage loss in the knees that had been injected with steroids. Why? Because steroids kills chondrocytes. Chondrocytes are the cells that live inside your cartilage that keep your cartilage healthy. And not only that, some of the canes that we use that we mix with steroid when we inject joints, bupivacaine and lidocaine, these are even more toxic to chondrocytes. They're deadly. What's wrong with the current algorithm? Menisectomy. The meniscus is a huge hunk of cartilage uh, in the knee on both sides, and it serves two purposes. It cushions the forces going through the knee, and it guides the joints as they, uh, the bones as they articulate against each other. Uh, a meniscectomy is when you remove some of the meniscus. Uh, this is also known as the, oh, you got some arthritis. We're going to go in and we're going to clean it up. So this is an arthroscopic procedure, as you can see right here. And what's the problem with it? Well, I'm quoting just two studies here, but the literature is quite clear. This should not be done. Why? Because knee surgery increases your risk of arthritis, period. Uh, Meniscectomy will increase your, your chance of getting arthritis uh, uh, three times in the eight years following uh, a knee arthroscopy. It does that because when you remove uh, meniscus, which cushions the knee, you're increasing joint loading forces. And if you increase joint loading forces in a knee, over time, you will destroy that knee. What's wrong with the current algorithm? Knee ligament repair. This is your anterior cruciate ligament. The repair of this ligament um, is not a repair, actually. It's an excision of a torn native ligament and a replacement with a uh, allograft or an autograft, a graft from another part of your body or a graft from a cadaver. Um, this is a procedure that orthopedics are very proud of, and rightfully so, because when you've torn your ACL, you can't play ball. And this procedure gets professional athletes back on the field. The problem is that you cannot duplicate the angle of the native ligament when you put in a graft. And we think that's why within 10 years of getting an ACL repair, that joint has arthritis. This is an article published in the New York Times in 2017, basically stating this uh, evidence. 50% of knees of uh, kids in their teens who are getting ACL repairs will have osteoarthritis by the age of, uh, in their mid-20s. What are you going to do then? You got a mid-20-year-old with arthritis. You got a problem. The article asked, will surgical techniques that more closely resemble native anatomy reduce the risk of arthritis? Well, our answer to that is you bet they will. And this is why we strive to preserve the native uh, anatomy of any joint. What's wrong with the current algorithm? Joint replacement. Now, quite often, this works fine. But unfortunately, there's a subset of patients in which it doesn't work fine, and particularly with knee replacement. Um, many of these patients have minimal functional improvement. Many patients complain of continued pain after joint replacement. And then there's the risk of metal and material fragmentation. So what's the promise of interventional orthopedics? Well, the promise of interventional orthopedics is that no surgery is involved. Uh, the attempt here is to use the body's ability to heal itself by harvesting repair hormones and cells, concentrating them, and focusing them and injecting them very precisely into injured tissues. And this is the art of this new field of medicine, is how you place it so precisely. Um, interventional orthopedics is, is minimally invasive. It reduces or eliminates entirely operative trauma. There is a minimal uh, post-procedure recovery, and there is a much less painful rehab. And the final result, when successful, is that we have preserved your native tissues. And again, we can't stress enough how important that concept is. And here's a cartoon of the... <coughs> the healthy balancing act inside your joint. 
uh, there are forces that are working to degrade the joint and forces that are working to repair the joint. And this is this occurs throughout the life of a joint. And when a joint is healthy, these forces are all in balance and the joint is doing fine. But when you have forces that break down a joint, catabolic forces and chronic inflammation uh, uh, factors, uh, this will over time begin to destroy a joint. What are the things that do that? Well, you've got uh, injury. You injure the joint playing a ball somewhere. This results in some micro instability and that joint is no longer as stable as it once was. It's moving a little too much and over millions and millions of flexion extension cycles and loading and unloading, the joint is just slipping a little too much and that's destroying the joint. Or you're carrying too much weight. That increases loading uh, through the uh, joint and that too will destroy a joint over time. Smoking is deadly to chondrocytes in the joint, does terrible things to the joint. So does poor diet, poor fitness, and a sedentary lifestyle. All of these things will begin to emphasize the factors that degrade a joint and tip the balance here towards degeneration in the joint. So in interventional orthopedics, what we're trying to do is work against forces that degrade a joint. And uh, so we're interested in the forces that work against cata uh, catabolism. Catabolism is a fancy name for breakdown. And uh, what, what are those forces? Well, they're chemicals that we have discovered in the past 15 to 20 years that are found in all human blood products. And these chemicals uh, are master keys to inhibit the enzymatic digestion of cartilage, which is what's occurring in arthritis and what's occurring in a painful joint. Uh, these substances are found in all human serum blood products. Uh, and they come by fancy names like IRAP, interleukin receptor antagonist protein, uh, alpha-2 macroglobulin, TIMP, which stands for tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases. Uh, so this is one of the things we're using in interventional orthopedics to arrest the degeneration in joints. Uh, the other factors are anabolic factors. What does anabolic mean? It means to build up a joint. And what are we talking about? We're talking about growth hormones. And by the way, you do not get a physique like this without the use of growth hormones. But we're talking about growth hormones that are naturally found in the body. These are not synthesized in any way. These are powerful cell signaling biological molecules found in all humans. They promote cell division and growth. They increase vasculature. They stimulate protein and matrix secretion. And they go by the names of platelet-derived growth factor, fibro fibroblast growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, just to name a few. So we're using these factors to tip the balance uh, uh, towards a healthy joint. Uh, and where do we find these factors? Well, we find them in our patients. These are autologous, meaning self, repair tissues. There are two flavors of repair cells in the human body. One's a small cell that circulates in your peripheral blood known as a platelet. So you may have heard of platelet-rich plasma. That's a concentration of these cells that we use uh, to address uh, injury in the body. Uh, the other is a stem cell. And in Regenix world, we find adult stem cells in the bone marrow. We call these repair cells orthobiologics because we're using a patient's biological tissue to treat orthopedic con uh, injuries. So let's go back here now. Uh, say you walk into my office and your knee is bothering you. And we've got an MRI and it, says, it shows a small tear in the medial meniscus. And there's not much else wrong with this knee. Uh, and so we think that this meniscal tear is significant. Well, I think I can probably treat that with just your platelets. So we would do a platelet injection, a PRP injection. And what do we get with that? Well, we get a whole host of anti-catabolic factors. These are the uh, substances we just talked about. Alpha-2 macroglobulin, IRAP, uh, tumor growth factor beta, uh, tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinase. And we also get at least one very powerful growth hormone, platelet-derived growth factor. And that can solve it for us. Now, if that tear is bigger or you have uh, some more advanced arthritis, I may say, well, we've got to use stem cells. And this would be a mesenchymal, uh, adult mesenchymal stem cell injection. With a stem cell injection, we get a whole host of powerful growth hormones. And with either injection, what we're doing is we're tipping the balance towards these factors that help to repair a joint. And we're putting our fingers on the scale more towards a healthy joint. So let's go back to the traditional algorithm and see how interventional orthopedics can change it. The algorithm is the same up until the point of the MRI. The MRI shows a tissue that's damaged and your clinical exam makes you think that, that the damage to that tissue is what's causing this patient's uh, symptoms. 
Well, an interventional orthopedics will recommend an orthobiologic injection. Following the injection, we'll send you back to rehab. And when we're successful, you have less pain, greater function. You've preserved your native tissue. And we have taken you out of the algorithm that pushes you inexorably towards joint replacement. We perform precise image-guided stem cell and platelet procedures to treat headaches, neck pain, upper back pain, shoulder arthritis, rotator cuff tears in the shoulder and labral tears in the shoulder, wrist and thumb arthritis, elbow arthritis, low back pain, sciatica, facet syndrome, disc herniations, bulges, and lumbar spinal stenosis. We treat hip arthritis and labral tears in the hip. We treat knee arthritis, knee meniscal tears, ACL tears in the knee. We treat ankle arthritis, ligament and tendon tears. Here are a few examples of uh, what we're doing. This is a um, sterilely draped knee. That's a knee poking up out of the sterile drapes. And this big thing over the patient, whose head is up here, is a uh, fluoroscopic C-arm. This is a real-time X-ray, and this is an image of the procedure as it's occurring. This is the MRI of this knee. And in this MRI, we see that in the kneecap, we've got this bright white lesion. And the reason why we have this lesion is because the cartilage behind the kneecap is breaking up. So... We've got to go into the kneecap with stem cells, and we have to inject behind the kneecap over the cartilage the same stem cells. So here's the trocar going into the kneecap, which you can see if you look closely right here. And then we're injecting stem cells into the kneecap. And this is a needle, which you can also see right here, coming in here on the fluoroscope. And this is dye being injected over the cartilage before we put in the stem cells. This is a real-time shoulder injection. Uh, the first injection is into the glenohumeral joint. The humerus is the long bone of the upper arm. The glenoid is the shoulder blade bone with which it articulates. This dye shows an injection into the glenohumeral joint. The second position shows dye in this triangular area. Well, that's the shoulder labrum. So this gives you an idea of how precise these injections are. This will give you even a, a, a more impressed, uh, impressive sense of how precise these injections are. This is your median nerve under ultrasound. This is in cross-section. This is a nerve. This is tiny. This thing coming in here is a needle. It looks huge. It's a 30 gauge. It's tiny. <clears throat> this, for scale, is the size of a pea. What we're doing is we're injecting platelets around this. We're hydrodissecting. In other words, we're taking, we're removing the surrounding connective tissue away from this nerve that entraps it. So those are just a few examples of what we do in interventional orthopedics. Why will interventional orthopedics replace elective orthopedic surgery? Because it's less invasive, because there's quicker recovery, and because there's preservation of native tissues and a superior result over time. If we don't have to replace your joint, you will always do better, better with your native joint. Uh, so I'm pausing here. It's about halfway through uh, for those of you who, who don't have the patience to stay for the remainder of the uh, presentation. This is how you would schedule an evaluation in my office. Okay, take a quick drink of water here and we'll go on. Progenics treatment, first steps, begins with the evaluation. When you come into the office, we want you to bring a tape recorder because there's going to be a lot of talking, just like there is now. I want you to bring a friend who can act like a tape recorder. Bring your story, bring your treatment history. Most importantly, bring your films. Any provider who is not interested in seeing your films is not a physician. And the clinic in which you're being evaluated is not the clinic you want to be evaluated in. Most important first step, is the diagnosis. Getting the best diagnosis is the most important thing as part of your evaluation. And quite often, it's a detective story. It's a mystery. Why has this joint failed when this joint is doing fine? And that takes some investigation. History will give you some clues. People come in and say, oh yeah, doc, I, yeah, I fell off a fence when I was eight. I walked funny with a lot of pain for about two or three weeks, and then it finally went away and I was fine. Well, that was probably one of uh, 30 or 40 hits to this joint, which caused it to fail over time. Or, uh, oh, I had surgery. I remember I had surgery on the labrum of this hip uh, playing soccer in high school. And I was fine until my mid-20s. And then the hip started to bother me. 
And now he shows up in my office 10 years after that, and the hit looks like this. Uh, you've also got to invest, you know, investigate uh, the the adjacent joints. I uh, quite often it's very common that people come in complaining bitterly of knee pain, and you take an X-ray of the knee, and the knee looks fine, and then you take an X-ray of the hip, and the hip looks like this, and that's because the hip bone is connected to the knee bone, is connected to the ankle bone via the kinetic chain. And if one joint in that chain is not healthy, the adjacent joint can be unhealthy as well. You have to know these things because if we focus all of our attention on this joint and miss the fact that you got a pinched nerve in your back causing weakness for the muscles around the hip, which cause this hip to be unstable, and I don't treat that, you're not going to get as better as you could if I, if I treat all the pathology that results in the failure of your joint. So are you a good candidate for these procedures? Who knows? Well, I'll tell you who knows. The patient registry of data that we keep. What's a registry? A registry is a repository of patient-generated outcome data following Regenex procedure. Since 2005, we've kept a, a registry of data of all of our patients. Any patient who does a Regenex procedure in my office or in any other Regenex affiliate across the country or around the world their email is pinged at one, three, six, and 12 months after the procedure and every 12 months after that. And they're asked, the patient is asked to fill out three very quick questionnaires about pain reduction, functional level, and overall improvement. And all of these results are found online. You can go to regenix.com and just hit the results tab, select the joint you want to investigate, and three graphs of, these, of this data will come up for each of these joints. It's from this data, and by the way, we're the only people in this field of regenerative medicine that has any data at all. It is from this data of outcomes that we can tell who does well with these procedures and who doesn't do so well. And what that does is it allows us to place you in one of three broad candidacy grades. After your initial evaluation, we're able to tell you, hey, you're a good candidate for this, you're a fair candidate for this, or you know what, you're a poor candidate for this. And by that, we mean if we think you're a good candidate, we think your chances of success are 60% or better. If you're in the fair category, we think your, category, your chances of success are 30 to 60%, whereas in the poor category, your chances of success are less than 30%. And, and by success, by the way, uh, success is determined by our patients. Doc, all I want to do is run again. Or, or, or Doc, I, I want to be able to walk 18 and not be crippled for two or three days afterward. All right, that's success for that patient. So that's what we mean when we say success. It's defined by our patients, not by the physician. So who's a good knee candidate? Well, that's a tough one because the, the success rate in knees that we treat is, has no correlation with the age of the patient, with the radiographic severity of the arthritis, with the sex of the patient, though the data does show that women do slightly better, or with the weight of the patient, the body mass index. So, you know, a healthy joint like this would be expected to do as well as a very arthritic joint like this if they had the same issue and the same structure were injected. So who's not a good candidate? Well, our data tells us that if you come into the office with two bad knees like this person here, you're not going to do as well if you have just one bad knee. Uh, similarly, if you have had three or more surgeries on the knee that bugs you, that's also a prognostic indicator that says that you're not going to do as well if you have as those knees that haven't had three surgeries. Uh, if you've had three or more joints impacted in the body, so if it's not just your knee that's bothering you, but you also have bilateral shoulder arthritis and hip arthritis, all of that arthritis usually indicates that there's a systemic pro-inflammatory condition in the body, which is going to be working against us for this type of work. Or if you come in with a grossly malaligned knee, like this poor person here, where the, the femur, the thigh bone is just sliding off the, the leg bone. I mean, you know, this is, I'm sorry, can't help you. Get the joint replaced. You'll probably be very happy. So this is uh, old data. This is uh, helping patients avoid knee replacement. This is data from 2017, but we like to, to quote it because it's held up over time. At the time, we were following 5,800 knees. Uh, going back to 2005, 3,400 of these had severe knee arthritis and were all candidates for total joint replacement. And what our data showed was that one to two years after treatment with their own stem cells, only 12.7% of patients felt that the knee was not good enough and that they had to go on and have the joint replaced. 
Another way to say this is that more than 87 out of every 100 patients we treated were happy enough with the stem cell treatment of their knee that they got no further surgery on it. Well, here's the data today. Now we're following almost 20,000 knees. And these are some of the graphs you'll see if you go into regenix.com and hit the results tab. This is a graph of knee function improvement over time. It's 20,000 knees. <clears throat> and you see the increase in function over time. And we're talking about going out, oh, six years here. This is a decrease in your average pain level. And you see it decrease over time, again, going out six years. Again, these are averages. Some people do a lot worse than this. Some people do a lot better than this. These are averages. This is not necessarily what any one person would get going into this. This is the third graph that you will see under the results of any uh, joint that you uh, uh, assess under, at Regenix.com. This is called the Single Assessment Numeric Evaluation, the SANE score. Basically, it's how much better are you? Give me a percentage. Well, this is the percentage improvement for our knees. At one month, patients are telling us they feel that they're 38% better. Over time, going out six years, they're 61% better. You know, these, these are all comers. We have very severe arthritic knees versus knees that have small tears in the meniscus. So again, these are averages. Some people do a lot better than this. Some people don't do as well as this. Hips. Hips don't do as well as other joints. We were the first people to discover this. We had to change our category, our candidacy grades accordingly. But now we've got a good handle on this. If you're under the age of 55 with mild arthritis, you're a good candidate. If you're over the age of 55, just that fact alone, you're just a fair candidate for what we do. If you're over the age of 55 and you've lost any motion whatsoever in that hip, you're a poor candidate. Basically, we tell you, you should save your money. Don't do what we're doing. Having said that, this is a knee, this is a hip rather, of a patient I told I don't think your arthritis up here is too severe. I don't think you're a candidate for stem cell. He said, well, let's try platelets. I said, all right, let's try platelets. We did platelets. He's doing great. It's only a couple months out, but he's doing great. I, I relate that story just to illustrate the fact that there are exceptions to all of these rules. There's exceptions. We'll discuss some more of them. Currently, we're following 5,400 hips in the registry. These are the graft of uh, functional improvement. This is the graft of decreasing in pain. And these are pretty good. Look at the data here. We're talking about functional improvement up to 88% and greater than 50% uh, reduction in pain. Now, this data has improved because we learned that hips don't do so well. And now we're turning away really severe arthritic hips because we know we can't help them. This is the SANE score for hips. People tell us one month after uh, the stem cell procedure, they're 34% better. You know, six years out, they're 63% better. Again, those are averages. Shoulder candidacy grades, that really depends on what exactly the diagnosis in the shoulder is. The shoulder is a very complicated uh, 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 joint. If you have severe arthritis, we think that you can do very well if the majority of your pain is coming from the rotator cuff. And this is the rotator cuff. These are the muscles that come over the top of the, of the joint and lift the arm. <clears throat> and this is a cartoon showing how we inject the rotator cuff. This is a ultrasound transducer bouncing, bouncing sound waves off the tissues. And this is a needle coming in. So we're, we're injecting these uh, tissues under direct visualization, watching the needle go precisely where we want it to. Uh, our registry data also indicates for shoulders that success has no correlation with age, sex, or obesity. So you've got a tear in your rotator cuff. What, what's your candidacy grade? Well, if you come in with a full thickness tear, but it's not retracted, or you have just a partial thickness tear, you're a good candidate for what we do. If that tear is full thickness and there is retraction, but it's only between two and 10 millimeters, you're, you're a fair candidate for what we do. If you come in with a full thickness tear retracted more than 10 millimeters, which is one centimeter, we don't think you're a very good candidate. We can't bridge that gap. Okay, having said that, take a look here. Here is a rotator cuff. You see it coming over the top and suddenly it stops. And there's a big gap here and a red arrow that says there's a tear. And this is the far end of the rotator cuff. Well, that tear is about 10 millimeters, one centimeter. We went ahead and injected it with stem cells and this is what it looked like post-procedure. It repaired itself. Let's say that the problem in the shoulder is arthritis. 
candidacy grades are slightly different. If you come in with mild up to moderately severe arthritis, we think you're a good candidate if we feel that most of the pain is coming from the rotator cuff. Or if you have just mild arthritis, you're a good candidate for what we do. You're a fair candidate if your arthritis is severe and if we're not certain whether the pain is coming from the rotator cuff or not. You're a poor candidate if you have severe arthritis with change in the shape of the ball, a large beard osteophyte, or a high riding ball. Well, here are three x-rays of the same shoulder showing a poor candidate. You see how uh, uh, disturbed the uh, ball joint is, how amorphous and weird looking it is. It's not quite round, it's kind of egg shaped. There's a very large bony osteophyte. This is what we call a beard osteophyte. And there's an osteophyte over here on the glenoid. This is what occurs when the shoulder is sliding up and down because it's so unstable. And the top of the glenoid is here. The top of the shoulder joint should be here instead of up here. So you got, you know, a trifecta here. You got a misshapen head, beard osteophyte, very unstable joint. I told this patient, you're a poor candidate for what we do. You understand that. Your chances of success are less than three out of 10, less than 30%. He said, doc, I want to try it anyway. I treated this patient with his stem cells. He came back a month later and said, Doc, I am 50% better. If I don't get any better than this for the rest of my life, I'm a happy man. This turned out to be a local internist. He has sent my patient. He has sent me eight patients to date. He is thrilled. He's been a great resource for this practice. Again, there's always exceptions to the rule. We're following about 7,200 shoulders. Here's the graph of functional improvement. Here's the graph of decrease in pain over time. Here's the same score on the shoulders. Shoulders do really well, as you see. There was a lot of improvement, a lot of functional improvement. Lumbar degenerative disc disease, DDD, is the acronym we use for that. You're a good candidate if you have even severe degenerative disc disease without severe stenosis. Stenosis means narrowing in the central canal, squeezing nerves. And the sine qua non of people who have stenosis is that they can't stand. So if your stenosis is such that you can stand for up to an hour with no pain, but you have severe degenerative joint disease, you're a good candidate for our lumbar spine treatment. You're also a good candidate if you have only up to grade one spondylolisthesis. That's a fancy word for one bone slipping forward on another, as you see here. See, the bones up here are lining up, but as you come down, this bone suddenly is forward on this bone. That's called spondylolisthesis. This is not a grade one. This is a grade two. So this is a poor candidate here. This is also a poor candidate because this woman has very severe arthritis in the central canal. She couldn't stand for more than 10 to 15 minutes at a time. I'd like to tell you that I treated this person and she got better, but I treated her and she didn't get much better. But I told her going in, she was a poor candidate for this type of treatment. So uh, people who come in and we treat them for degenerative disc disease and they don't get better and they have a problem with sitting, these are people whose discs we then go into with their stem cells. These are people that we that we think have discogenic pain, okay? The hallmark of people with discogenic pain is they can't sit, period, can't sit. 15 to 30 minutes, they got to get up. They got to get up. They can't tolerate it. They either have to stand or lie down. Uh, you're a good candidate if you can't sit for more than 15 to 30 minutes, but you have good disc height and you have a tear in your annulus. This disc is the same height as this disc, the normal disc above it, and it has this white streaking annular tear in it. This is a good candidate. You're a fair candidate if you can't sit for 15 to 30 minutes, but you've lost a little bit of disc height. You've lost 15 to 75%. You have only 15 to 75% of disc height. You've lost about 25% of disc height and you have an annular tear. You're a fair candidate. You're a poor candidate if that disc has lost 50% or more of disc height. You're not gonna do well with this. Say you have a disc protrusion with sciatica. You're a good candidate. If you have a disc protrusion, extrusion, a free fragment, if you have a well-preserved disc height. You're only a fair candidate if that disc protrusion is subligamentous. This black line re re uh, uh, represents the uh, posterior longitude and the ligament in the spine. And you see this disc protrusion is beneath it. Well, this ligament kind of walls it off. So we can't really get at it with orthobiologics. 
we think you only have a fair chance if that's the case with your disc protrusion. Or if you have a hard disc, and this is a calcified disc or a disc that protrudes with a bony ridge osteophyte like what we see here. This is a CT scan showing a bony calcification in this disc protrusion right here. You're a poor candidate. Uh, we're following 14,200 uh, lumbar spine outcomes. These are the graphs of functional improvement and decrease in pain. This is the same score for our lumbar uh, spine patients over time. The 30,000 foot view, we're able to help many patients with severe arthritis avoid knee replacement. This doesn't work by growing you a new knee. It works by making the toxic chemical environment in your knee healthier. It works by making the knee more stable. It works by throwing up a huge roadblock to the further progression of arthritis. We're able to help many patients with severe shoulder arthritis, avoid a joint replacement. We're able to help many patients with shoulder rotator cuff tears or shoulder labral tears avoid surgery. We're able to help many patients with chronic back and leg pain or other knee or joint ligament tears. This is a before and after of the anterior cruciate ligament in a knee that was badly torn playing soccer. You can see it's all exploded and lots of gray scale. This is a this is read as a complete ACL tear. We injected it with stem cells and six months later, perfectly normal looking ACL. We love to show these because these are dramatic before and afters, which by the way, we don't always have. Quite often we'll treat a joint. It doesn't look any much, very much different after we treat it, but we don't care what it looks like. If our patients are able to get back to running, getting back to playing the sports they wanna play because they have less pain. I'd like to end with just a little word of caution about stem cell hype. We're living in an age, because this field of medicine is so new, uh, we're living in an age that uh, Dr. Centeno likes to call the stem cell wild west. What this means is there's a lot of people uh, purporting to be injecting stem cells who have little to no training, who uh, heaven knows what they're injecting, and a lot of this is fraudulent. There are three phases of procedural adoption. When a new procedure comes down the pike, like we have here in interventional orthopedics, the first phase is, man, this is magic. It helps everybody. Well, that's the first phase. You do this for a year or more, and, and that wears off. You get a little bit more sober, and you come back with, well, you know what? This is great, and it helps almost everybody. And if you do it for a couple of years after that, you get to the point where, hey, let's figure out who's a good candidate. This is phase three. We are the only practice in the world that's in phase three. Everyone else in this space is still pretending that this is magic. As the inventors of these procedures, the biggest abuse we see is amniotic, placental, or cord stem cell injections. And this is the pitch made by a chiropractor typically Oh, your stem cells are no good. You're too old. We're going to use stem cells from an umbilical cord. Well, this is, this is fraud because we've analyzed these things and there's not a single living cell inside them. They are dead tissues. And they better be dead tissues because the federal government regulates them as dead tissue products. And if there is something alive in them, not only is it a danger to your health, it is against the federal code of regulations. But they're out there and they're being injected into knees. And do they work? They can be helpful, actually. Yeah. How do they work? Well, this is stuff that is picked up out of the back door of an OBGYN clinic. And what they get out of this stuff is a few growth factors. We've analyzed this and we've seen it. But I'm telling you, the growth factors in these commercial preparations pale in comparison to what a trained physician can get from their living patient. Mostly these procedures are also done uh, in chiropractic offices where they usually use no imaging guidance. The people doing the injections are either a nurse or a physician assistant, and certainly not the chiropractor who has no license to do that type of injection. They're injecting dead cell products, and the costs are often far higher than having them performed by the world's expert in this field. So just be aware. And of course, I'm drinking the Kool-Aid, but if you're considering doing something like this, for good reason, I would say you do this with a Regenix affiliate or save your money. Don't do it at all.
That concludes my presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. This is how you would schedule an evaluation in my office. And I really appreciate everybody coming out tonight on a rather damp, uh, somewhat warmer, but still cold evening to listen to all this. And I hope I didn't go on too long. It's, it looks like it went on about 40 minutes. It's a little longer than I usually like to go. Uh, uh, let's see. Let me get back to see if anybody has any questions. You want to type in a question? I still am not able to do this live. So just type your question. It'll come up. I'll, I'll answer it for you. Happy to do that. Uh, Nettie uh, wants to know if we can get a copy of the recording of the session. You certainly can. Just please contact my office and uh, we'll send you a link. Uh, it's a lot of information we covered, and I'm sorry if I lost you or it wasn't very clear. I mean, this is something I do, as you uh, uh, can possibly tell, I, I do this for many hours every day, explaining to patients uh, what the what it is we do, what the data says, uh, what their options are. Uh, is this covered with health insurance and how much for each joint? Unfortunately, no, uh, Bob, it's not. Um, this is still fairly newfangled. Uh, Regenex is in the process of invading the commercial insurance market. To that end, we have quite a few million uh, corporate patients, we call them. We sell this, uh, we sell Regenex procedures to large corporations that self-insure the health of their employees. And these folks are keenly interested in saving money in orthopedic surgery, uh, surgical costs. We come in, tell them who we are, what we do, here's our data, show them our data. And they usually sign up with us because they've got nothing to lose. It doesn't cost them a dime to do so. So I'm seeing more and more corporate patients who walk into, these are lucky ones. They have third party reimbursement uh, uh, payer for these procedures. Everybody else has to pay cash. Uh, the way it works in my office is you come in, I evaluate you. Um, I send you a proposal. There is no point of sale pressure here. I'll send you a proposal. We'll break down the cost line item by line item. You'll know exactly what it, uh, uh, it will cost you. You can consider this in the privacy of your home. You have questions, you call me. Okay. We're medical doctors. We're not used car salesmen. We understand that this is money out of your pocket. You've got to be comfortable with what we do. So, you know, we try to make you as comfortable as possible. Uh, I've been told, let's see, this is from Lori. I've been told I need a complete shoulder replacement. I'm not interested in surgery. Lori, if you have films, come on in. If you don't have films, come in. I'll order the films for you. Uh, I'll give you an honest opinion. You know, the shoulder may be too far gone, and I'll tell you that. If that's something I think I can help you with, I'll tell you that too. Happy to, uh, happy to evaluate you. Uh, Marianne says, I got here late. We'll also need to get the link to watch. Marianne, just contact the office. Uh, uh, Call my admin, uh, Patty, and um, she'll send you the link. Just send her an email and say, I'd like a link to the last night's session. She'll send it to you. Uh, can you all see that? That's Patricia at IOCT.info or the phone number 203-456-5717. Again, I really appreciate you all coming out. Um, let's see, other questions. Margaret, uh, does insurance cover this? I, I think I answered that, Margaret. Um, Nettie again. I have a hip replacement, which has caused some knee pain. Would I still be a good candidate for a knee injection? Absolutely. Absolutely, Nettie. Yeah, come on in. We'll, we'll take a look at that knee and see what status it's in. Krishna, MSC stem cell works or not? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it works. Um these are medical procedures, uh, folks. Um, there is a bell curve of response. People all the way out here responding a little bit. People towards the middle, which is where everybody's bunched up, they're responding. They're responding. You know, that's an average of response. People out here at the far end, these people are responding a lot. And that's typical of any medical procedure. So, yes, stem cells work. Um, is it magic? Does it work for everybody? No, no. And that's not what we're um, talking about here. 
uh, Bob, how much for the first office evaluation? Uh, the way we work it here, Bob, is if you have insurance, you come in, <clears throat> we'll see you under your insurance. In fact, I'll treat you if you haven't had any treatment under your insurance up until the point where I feel, okay, the traditional algorithm isn't working for you. I think you need orthobiologics, and this is what that will cost you. That's the model I've always used. If you don't have insurance, my initial evaluation is $300 cash. And that includes an ultrasound examination of the joint uh, and uh, then a proposal. Uh, Matthew, is there a procedure that helps repair a pinched nerve with muscle atrophy around the elbow from a herniated disc in the neck? Yes, yes, there is, Matthew. It's called a platelet lysate epidural uh, in the cervical spine. Uh, Lori again. Is the eval free? No, no, the eval is not free. Um, you're taking the doctor's time. The doctor's time is is valuable, so you got to pay for that. Uh, like I say, Lori, we'll see you under your insurance. You come in with insurance, we'll see you under your insurance, like you would uh, be evaluated by any other physician. We're all physicians here. Anonymous attendee, what is the average cost of a knee bone? <laughs> all right, we get this all the time, and it's hard to say <clears throat> until I see you and see exactly what I have to do. <clears throat> Ballpark figures, stem cells hover right around 5,000. They can go up to seven, eight, depending on what we're doing and how many joints we're treating. Um, uh, PRP injections start around eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200. They can go up as much as $3,400, $4,000. It really all depends on how bad the pathology is, how much work I'm doing. And I'll tell you, Quite often, I'm treating two and three joints at once. I'm spending an hour and more injecting a patient with their blood product. Um, so this is a lot of work. Um, but those are rough ballpark figures. Um, you know, this is not the moon. I think I made the point there at the end when I was cautioning you about stem cell hype. Uh, there are, uh, you know, clinics out there and chiropractors who are charging ten and fifteen thousand dollars for some dead tissue product that they're calling stem cells, which is not stem cells. Uh, being injected blindly into your joint. So be careful of that. Um, through eugenics, you'll always be treated by a medical doctor. Always, always, always. Uh, Bob, sounds good. We'll contact office. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for attending. Any further questions? Anybody I missed? Matthew, talked to Bob, Krishna, Nettie a couple of times, Margaret. Any other questions, folks? Hazel. Hi, Hazel. Not a question. The dream I see from you has enabled me to hike 10 plus miles and more. Thank you. Thank you, Hazel. I really appreciate the testimonial. That's very sweet of you. Hazel's a patient of mine, everybody. Well, if there's no other questions, I guess we'll wrap it up this evening. Once again, I, I'd like to thank everybody who uh, took the time to, to listen. Really appreciate that. Have a good night. Bye-bye.